operations and I run all the engineering operations. So basically I tell everybody I have all the problems because it's always either a maintenance problem or it's an engineering problem. You probably hear more about this tomorrow from Dave about where Kentucky is ranked, but obviously automotive manufacturing is a very important part of the Kentucky economy since they're now the number third ranked for car production. Um, there are nearly 460 facilities, so it's not all just the big assembly plants. In fact, it's the, a lot of the suppliers, we have a lot of them around here that uh, support the local economies and what they do and support the big, the big car mills. A little bit about me. Uh, I have an industrial engineering degree from the University of Missouri a long time ago. Uh, I did go get my MBA at a small graduate school of business out east. I started with GM as a summer intern. I've been to Detroit. I've worked in Cincinnati. I was in Boston. I was in Detroit my first five years. And I went to Spring Hill, Tennessee, and I was there for 21 years. So a long time with Saturn Corporation. Uh, I moved to Bowling Green in 2010 in my current job. I've kind of done a lot of different things, plastic injection molding, steel stamping. I've done information and control systems. I've run a paint shop. I've run general assembly. I worked in engineering, production, material maintenance. Some people would say I can't hold a job. But that's okay. <laughs> a little bit about the plant. Originally, it was uh, a Chrysler air conditioning plant in 1969, so it was built to do that. Not necessarily to manufacture automobiles, so if we were doing it today, we would obviously design it to be a lot different and would look a lot different than what you're going to see, but we used it as best we could. And as we do the new paint shop, obviously then you'll see a, a ground up, built from scratch design for automotive manufacturing. GM purchased it in 79 and started producing Corvettes in 81. In 92, the millionth Corvette was built. That's the one that went down into the sinkhole not too long ago. It's out and it's under restoration. 2003, the XLR began and the 50th anniversary of Corvette was celebrated. 2009, unfortunately, XLR ended. The one and a half millionth Corvette was built and it also went down into the hole, so it's come out. I know 2011, we celebrate our 30th anniversary in Bowling Green. 2013, we built out the sixth generation of Corvette and started the current model, which is the seventh generation of Corvette. A little bit about the plant. It's approximately a million square feet on 212 acres. Um, we run one shift. It says five eight-hour days, but we've been running 10-hour days because the demand for the product is so high since we started uh, in 13 on the seventh generation. In eight hours, we do 137 cars, 17 units an hour. So that'll be the conveyor speed you see when you go through the plant today. We have approximately 1,000 people, about 121 salary, 100 contract, and about 753 hourly. We have employees from Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, Louisiana, Texas, probably a lot of other states we didn't name up here. We provide about 88.4 million in wages and about 18 million in payroll taxes. So again, pretty significant impact to the local economy. These are our products. The seventh generation Stingray Coupe began the third quarter of 2014. The convertible began the same time. And then the 2015 Corvette, which began last fall, and the Corvette convertible. So right now, there's one of these out there in crystal red metallic that Andrea and I brought over. The 14 Corvette was the most powerful standard one ever. There's 455 horsepower and 450 pound-feet of torque. Um, it goes from 0 to 60 in 3.8 seconds. It'll hold more than 1 G in the corners. It's the most fuel-efficient one ever, rated at 29 miles per gallon on the highway. And uh, it's the most <coughs> fuel-efficient car on the market that's ever been offered over 400 horsepower. So, pretty impressive, and at least until you get to the Z06, and it comes with 650 horsepower and 650 pound-feet of torque. It'll go from 0 to 60 in less than 3 seconds. Um, it can stop from 60 miles an hour in less than 100 feet, and so can the standard one actually. So it's the best braking performance of any GM model. A little bit about also in the plant, there is a performance build center where you can build your own engine. It's about 20,000 square feet. Um, we run about 28 engines a day. There's about 30 employees that do that. 
And for the low, low price of about $5,000, you can go in there, build your own engine, put your name on your engine, have it put in your car. Um, so, and we've done about uh, 50 of those since we started in February, Andrea, is that about right? These are the products we make there. The LS7, which was an engine that was originally in the sixth generation Corvette, now is in the Camaro, we build there. And then the LT4, which is the engine in the Z06, we build there also. To kind of give you a layout of the plant, you're gonna come in probably this way, go around to the parking lot, go into the tour entrance up here. This part is the paint shop. This is where we do the pre-treat and elpo on the frame. You'll come in, you'll probably go through the trim portion, general assembly, the chassis portion, you'll see cockpit. This is that performance engine build center we talked about. There's a material consolidation area right here. Over here is the body shop, which you're going to get the opportunity to walk through. Most of the tours do not go through there, but you'll get to see some special interesting stuff over here, and I have some slides about that. Back in here is audit, another material, the maintenance area, and then up front are the administration offices. A little bit about what goes on in there in the body shop. There's 60 process robots and 29 material handling robots. So we basically took in most of the conveyors out of the body shop. Everything gets transferred by a robot now instead of a conveyor. We do laser welding, structural adhesives. We have three vision systems. I'll get a little bit more at the end into what goes on in the body shop. Pre-tree electric coat, we basically quickly clean the frame with a light acid. Gets all the oil, grease, any other deposits off there, and we put an anti-corrosion dip on it. In paint, we have 25 robots. They apply a waterborne prime base and clear. So it's a lot different than the old solvent-based paints. We have 29 fans that generate almost 3,000 horsepower to keep air balance, humidity, and temperature in check. The paint's oven cured. It gets stacked in a big stacker out back so we can rearrange and put them in the proper sequence. Um, we burn off a lot of our uh, chemicals and basically solvents that are in the air get burnt off at about 1450 degrees through three big ovens out back. And then we have our performance engine build center, which we've already talked a little bit about. In general assembly, we have cockpit door, trim, chassis, and final conveyor systems. All that's where those parts get built up. Cockpit, they build the instrument panel. Doors, they put on hinges, mirrors, and regulators. In trim, they install the seats, the hatch, the glass, the quarters, and the doors. In chassis, they install the engine, the suspension, the exhaust hood, fenders, fluids, and wheels. Final, they check the fits and start the car. And in general assembly, we have basically door install fixtures. We have robotic glass cells, fluid fill, brake fill. And then the conveyor types are power and free. Tovayer, roller, we have some HID and chain on edge conveyors also. Andrea. That was supposed to be the picture for the back up of this slide. In the powerhouse, where we generate a bunch of the power, we have boilers that generate about 30,000 BTUs per hour boiler capacity. We have chiller capacity of 7,500 tons. We have total compressed air, ca air capacity of 7,000 cubic feet feet at 1100 PSI, the weekend air compressor and waste treatment capacity of 225,000 gallons a day. We use about 400,000 gallons of water a week out of the plant. Now we're going to get into a little bit of the areas, the departments that I have. So plant engineering, I basically have some environmental engineers. They work on com reports, permits, <laughs> compliance. And then our wildlife habitat, they also have responsibility for that. But obviously they're going through a lot right now because of all the air permitting that has to go with the new paint shop. So all the things that get put off in that process have to be dealt with before they go into the atmosphere <coughs> and make the state of Kentucky happy and the city happy and our neighbors happy and all that. I have process engineers that work with the equipment. They work on tools equipment, workstation set up. We have a lot of torque tools, Atlas, Copco, electronic, electronically controlled tools that talk over net. 
We've actually got one wireless station where the tool is wireless. There's some sensors around, and when you walk outside of the sensor, the tool goes dead, and when you walk back in, the tool comes alive, so you can only use it on the body in that station. Some of my engineers are leaders of maintenance teams. Uh, they work on preventative maintenance, planning, and completion. I have some facilities engineers that work on the infrastructure, heating, cooling, power, water, building envelope, mobile equipment. I have controls engineers. These guys do all the PLC logic, uh, human, human and machine interface, uh, PLCs, PCs, robotics. They work on the field devices, switches, scanners, uh, all those good proc switches. And I understand you guys are now all qualified to do that, right? Cool. Oh, so you're not qualified for tomorrow? I am. I'm qualified today. I'm running anything you need to do. Mechanical engineering and facilities, they deal with structural issues. Um, we have quite a few things that get wet. When steel meets water, we generally get rust and therefore reduce structural integrity, so we deal a lot with that. Truss loading, facility doors, I deal with conveyor mechanical, either new installation of new, repairing the old, or refurbishing the old. Um, we have about 30 air houses on top of the building, central exhaust and paint supply areas are separate, and paint ovens are obviously a big mechanical thermodynamics problem. Uh, maintenance group leaders and process engineers, I have one in the body shop, one in the paint shop, one in GA. Um, they basically diagnose, troubleshoot, and repair equipment, validate the new installations for safe operations, cycle time, and downtime. They implement ideas that improve uptime, eliminate waste, and improve the quality of the operations, which is really what we're trying to focus our whole production <laughs> system around, it, is it's constantly getting better. Um, they implement new technologies into the process. Out in the powerhouse, I have one engineer for the diagnosis, troubleshooting, and repair of chillers, compressors, boilers, and tank farms we just talked about, and provide energy usage improvements. Another thing that we're really trying to be big on is reduction of energy and reduction of water. Electrical engineering, I've got one facilities electrical engineer. He works with incoming power substation and busways, um, expansion planning of electrical loads. For example, with the new body shop, we changed where we needed electrical loading from one area of the plant to the other, so that was a big job. Diagnosis and problem solving, uh, we big areas fuse analysis for proper failure modes. Uh, it's a pretty big electrical problem to figure out where all these fuses are in the system and how, which order each one of them should fail under which load. I have three controls engineers, one in body, one in paint, one in GA. They diagnose and troubleshoot control systems, validate the new equipment installation for safe operation, cycle time, and downtime recovery. Again, they're involved in improvement for uptime, reducing waste, help the quality out. They implement new technologies, and that's where really most of the fun is in the electrical technology. And one systems guy, he diagnoses, troubleshoots, and repairs our communication networks, ethernet, device net, um, data highway, those kinds of things. Configures backups, does some reporting and monitoring on the health of those communication systems. I have four chemical engineers in paint. They develop the process parameters for air pressure, temperature, humidity, material flow, and bake times to make sure we get as good a surface finish as we can. They work on application techniques, robot pathing, whether they should use bells or whether they should use guns. Uh, they work on the material composition of the paint itself and problem solving the defects. And then my two environmental engineers work on analyzing the waste streams for Clients, they perform testing, they do reporting. You'd be amazed at the regulatory reporting that's required from a plant our size. They work with community environmental programs and then they work on permitting issues. All right, so um, I went to my engineers and I asked them what they like best about their jobs. So these are some of the, I guess you, I can't say it's unsolicited since I asked them what they like best about their jobs, but here's kind of what they told me, right? They like about their jobs the opportunity to get to use the latest technologies. 
they can make valuable and measurable improvements. When you go out and see that you make an improvement in the quality of the car, you can see it from one car to the next. Or when I improve my cycle time, they can see it takes less time to build the next car than this one. It's a pretty good feeling to have a measurable result of your, your work, right? They get to solve tough problems. They get to make the job easier for the operators. They apply technology to real life problems. And they get to enhance existing technologies behind the original intent. We get lots of new equipment that comes into the plant. Usually it's about half baked. So they get the opportunity to take that from whatever level it's in to the next level and make a bunch of improvements to the equipment. Now, to go to the skilled trades, right? These are the guys that are out on the line that are responding to faults and alarms. I've got 27 electricians. These guys are out there installing, troubleshooting, and repairing robots, variable frequency drives, programmable logical controllers, power tools, scanners, field devices, and electrical controls, communication networks, and discrete I.O. Which you don't have to explain because you guys understand all that now, right? But these guys are out there dealing with that stuff you can't see. I always tell them I don't mind going to a mechanical breakdown because I can see where I got a weld or a piece of chain back together or something else. But it's hard to see those little electrons flow out of that wire, right? You never know whether they're, they're really flowing or not. I have 14 millwrights. They install, troubleshoot, and repair conveyor mechanical systems, gearboxes, trolleys, chains, carriers, and vertical lifts. I have 14 pipe fitters. They diagnose, troubleshoot, and repair pneumatic and hydraulic control systems, sealer systems, and dispense systems. Have you guys done any work around this? Hydraulic, mechanical, pneumatic? No. I have 13 tool makers. They design, fabricate, and assemble job-specific tooling and fixtures. A lot of times production will come and say, hey, we need help with because this particular job is hard to do or this part, part's hard to move or fit. So we come up with stuff to help them. They generate urgent spare parts. So if I break a shaft or I break a, oh, I don't know, chain support or something, they're usually able to uh, generate one kind of on the fly. They provide operator assist devices. I've got five stationary engineers. These are the guys that run the powerhouse. We do that five days a week, 24 hours a day with five people covering. We also do wastewater checking. I have three truck repairmen that basically take care of all the mobile equipment, which when you go out there today, you'll see there's a lot of mobile equipment in the plant. Right now, 50% of my skilled trade force work, or work my skilled trades workforce is over 60 years old, so I'm expecting to see heavy turnover. So you can see why our concern around what's in the pipeline for these kinds of skilled positions, because you definitely have to have some skill to do the things these guys do. Um, they have an opportunity to develop in, in the, or to participate in the development of new equipment. I will appoint some to start working on the paint shop next year. The paint shop will be about a two year development process before it's done. I mean, we still will start construction this year. It'll be two full years. So the skilled trades will have the opportunity to go see what the new applications are, the new robots. Um, for the current body shop, for example, six skilled trades spent 18 months in Detroit but we did a little bit different there. We took that body shop, we set it up in a warehouse up in Detroit. But they spent 18 months getting to know how to diagnose the equipment, how to make it run, how to repair it. They got to see all the faults, all the problems they had with the initial startup of the equipment. So that was invaluable to helping me make the thing run once it got down here and was transferred to Bowling Green. And then, for example, right now, Spring Hill, Tennessee is hiring 15 new electricians just because they're kind of going through the same turnover thing right now. So, really a big demand at this point for skilled trades in the industry for people that can deal with these new electrical mechanical systems, kind of like you guys just have been seeing for the last couple of days. All right, so this is kind of two-part. Any questions about that before I kind of get into the details of the new body shop? Because that's kind of technically the cool part of the plant right now. What are they making at Spring Hill now? They're making the Equinox, and then they're getting ready to start up with the Cadillac SUV. What are they doing? 
what kind of um, <coughs> skills would you be looking for in a new employee that's entry level? What would they need to have? If you're talking about the skilled trades, definitely we're looking for the technical capability. But right now, we're also looking for problem solving capability, ability to work in the team. Those are the two other other big things that we're looking for in addition to skills. And if, if somebody out of high school um, came to you guys for an entry level position, is there anything available for them and then they can work their way through school to? Right now, due to the way that it, the international contract with the UAW is set up, I can't do that. Okay. Now, I'm looking for opportunities to figure out how to do that in the future, but right now, right. that's okay. not an option for us. So they would have to go to school and get some sort of skill first and then come right. back. But I think what we're going to see, based on the numbers for my plan are not unique, a lot of the plans, because of the nature of the business, we went through that time where we laid off a bunch of people that made the demographic for the skilled trades elevated at age, right? So a lot of plants are going to go through this big turnover. I think just the sheer demand for people is going to force the way that system works to change to be able to do some of the things you're talking about. Any other questions? All right, so the body shop. Again, what you're going to go into, what you're going to see is it's at the east end of the plant. Really starts off kind of here where we start welding together the pieces that make the floor pan, the tunnel, the side rails, and then they all get welded together through the framing line right here. So by the time you get done here, you've kind of got the metal frame that's all together. It goes here to the Elpo pre-treat where we do that acid wash. We dip it in. Elpo, turn it black, and it comes down, and goes here to the ceiling line. And this is where we apply all the, adhes all the adhesives and structural adhesives that we put on. Actually, a lot of the car is held together more by structural adhesives than some of the welds and flow drill screws we're going to talk about in a minute. But. And then it goes over to GA, where they start putting every, all the other fancy stuff on, like the panels and stuff, right? Body shop's all new. It runs at 18 jobs an hour. They're basically the 30 operators, the 91 robots I talked about. 95% of the joining operations are automated. We talked about the robotic transfer, getting rid of all the conveyors, and you'll see that. What's most interesting at the end of the line, when I load this thing to send it to GA, I do that with a big robot transfer, but it's all up in the air, so nobody really sees that, but it's really pretty sexy up there if you ever make it up there. Material deliveries all via truck, tugger, and AGC. AGC carts you'll see are another interesting little thing. They're little carts that roll along the floor and you step in front of them and they stop and you know, step in front of them and they keep going. So you'll see those today. But uh, basically we've had some good reductions, 9% lead time reduction, 40% floor space reduction in square meters from the old shop and a 38% reduction in head count with the new body shop versus the old. These are the joining technologies. We have gas metal arc weld. Here's gas metal arc weld. <laughs> wow. this is, this. We have aluminum spot welding because the body is all aluminum. It's not going to do this right. But what we're seeing here is these are the different points in the car where we're doing these technologies. So flow drill screw is also a new technology for us. Let's quit that. Oh, maybe I can do that. Let's do this. Yeah, so basically we put about 14 or 15 meters of arc welding on the car. You can see where this is. These are all aluminum parts. Some are hydroformed, some are cast. These rails are hydroformed. Some are stampings, like you'll see here below the seats. The laser welding is done in a booth. And uh, basically run that with television monitors because you can't be in the booth with a laser because it's class four laser. And so we have had a few issues where we've had 
We have had lasers not perform the way we thought they were going to perform. Some abnormality things happen, so we've got to shut those things down, watch the TV, see what they do, go in, make repairs, um, rebuild some things, and go on. Aluminum resistant spot welding is actually a patented process by GM. There are some interesting things you have to do and it doesn't act at all like steel spot welding. Um, steel spot welding, what you do is if you're not getting a good weld, you clamp harder, you fire longer, and you fire more current. What we found with aluminum is you do some of those things. First of all, you can't clamp harder because aluminum doesn't deflect like steel. You're already operating in a high level of current and you don't want to fire longer because the aluminum gets brittle in the weld. So there's some different learning processes to go on here. What you're going to see is after every welding cycle, we have to address the tip, which is something you don't do with steel spot welding. Flow drill screws is a new operation where actually you spin the screw at pressure at speed and it creates its own hole. Works good as long as the pilot holes are in the right place, as long as the screw is perfectly perpendicular and you have the right pressure and the right speed. When none of those factors is at its perfect position, you end up with some problems. So again, this is an issue where some of the trades are involved right now trying to do some problem solving around how to reduce the time we spend dealing with these flow drill screw heads. But basically you go into the part with this head, you spin the screw at a certain rotation, certain pressure, and it makes its own hole into the part, and then you can actually remove the screw if you need to for repair. So it's not like it's welded in there, it's not like the metals of the aluminum and the screw join together, they stay separated. Here's what I'm talking about in the booths. That's actually in the booth. What you're seeing is one wall of the booth turn around. This is what you see on the television camera for the robots welding with the lasers. There's three of these lasers in two different booths over in the body shop that make these various welds. So, um, get to see some fast welding rates with that and you're welding some really thin stuff. I know you guys have had some welding experience now. And so this will be something you probably won't see as well when you take the tour, but this is a pretty good representation here on the screen. Uh, gas metal arc welding is again where we join, you're seeing where we join castings. Um, it's mainly in the subassembly operations, back where we're putting the rails together and where we're putting the tunnel together. Uh, there's basically 14 FANUC robots involved in our arc, metal arc welding operations. And then I mentioned that we have a lot of sealer operations. This is the frame sealer in these areas. Here's our structural adhesive, which is really keeping the car together. And we have some bolts then finally that we use to put the cockpit where we mount the cockpit or the IP in the car. So here's where, here's where we're spraying our sealer operation. You kind of see it's covering that weld seam there. So that's really for uh, water intrusion, air intrusion. We have a two component urethane sealer that does that. And we have some dispense equipment from Schuker in Germany that presents its own interesting problems from a black box standpoint and the way they deal with software. We have our structural sealer. What you're going to see is this is actually the exterior part of the panel that goes below the door. We call that the door ring. It's being applied to the side of the frame. And since it's plastic and the frame's aluminum, you have to glue it on to get it to stay. So that's what we're doing here. And you, you'll probably see this operation when you go through the body shop. And then we go to the paint shop. We already talked about how we e-coat the process. We take all the panels. This you can see because they're not on the car. They're painted on a buck here. All the panels sit on there. We paint them. And we take them off, send them over to GA, and they actually put them on the car over there. All right.
That's about perfect timing. Any questions? Any answers? <laughs>